The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on this crisp autumn day of October here at St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. This weather is so very delightful to me. To those of you who are gathered with us in person and to those of you who are joining by way of Zoom, I am glad that we can be together on this day that the Lord hath made. If you're visiting with us this morning, please know that we're honored that you came our way and stopped by to join us. I'd also like to say before we call ourselves to worship that I've had friends in town this weekend and I was able to show them our church yesterday actually for a few minutes and a little bit of New Orleans later in the evening. And you all should just know that this congregation and this lovely sanctuary, this city, it all makes me so incredibly proud to share with guests and with loved ones, it truly does. And now with my effusive praise out of the way, friends in the loving steps of Christ, let us join our voices together in the call to worship using the printed liturgy found in your bulletins. I'll read the non-bolded portions and we'll all read the bolded parts together. This is taken from a, a poem by Mary Oliver called Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Amen. Why don't you join me in prayer? Our Father, who loves us with everlasting love, may we, we rejoice in that love and endeavor day by day to show our love for you by glad obedience to your will. Keep us pure, strong, and full of trust in you that we may be victorious over temptations to wrongdoing, and may we ever know the joy and help of your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name.
Our first reading this morning is from Psalms 92, verses 1 through 4. In your pew Bible, that's page 478. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Will those who are able please stand with me and join us together in our prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Late have we loved you, O God, beauty so old and so new. We spend so much time searching for your peace in other things, but we often fail to recognize your presence within them. You are ever present with us, though our minds are not always turned to you. Yet you call to us, yet you shine radiantly around us. Your resplendence beckons us near. You're the alluring fragrance of spring and summer. Draw us near by your grace. Inspire us to attain the peace that is yours. Amen. Friends, God's love for us is plentiful. God's welcome is unceasing. God's mercy is like a boundless ocean. By God's grace, we are made whole. Alleluia. Amen. And may the God of new life restore and continue to make new our life together. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share signs of God's peace with one another. Our second reading for today is taken from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 
chapter 5, verses 16 through 19. If you are following along in your pew Bible, it is on page 940. Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Amen. I'll ask our ushers now to please come forward. And as they do, I believe everyone here in this room knows of the conventional ways that you can give back to the life of the church. Um, please remember though that you can give via our website or on your phone and momentarily as the offering plate comes to you. As we do all of this, we trust that God is able to do infinitely more with our shared gifts and resources when we share them together, sustaining both our congregational life and all of the many ways that we share this sacred space, this campus with others throughout our community. 
And for all of this, we give thanks to God. We come now to our time of prayer together, which provides us a chance to bring the concerns and joys that are foremost on our minds to God, who is our peace. This time of prayer, I like to think of it also as a chance to practice compassion, tuning our hearts to be compassionate and to empathetically remember the cares and the anxieties that others are carrying within our families, our friendship groups, among our colleagues, across our city, our nation, throughout our world. And there's much going on throughout our world today. Let us begin as we do by moving into a period of silence after which I'll lead us in spoken prayer. And this morning, I'll guide us through a series of petitions, have a few seconds of silence, and I'll end that with Lord in your mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. Following these petitions, of course, we'll have the Lord's Prayer, which we'll also say together. Friends, let us now pray. Loving God, we bring before you now the concerns of our hearts both our joys and the things that have left us feeling tender or wounded or worried this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you others we know who are hurting this day, those who are lonely or scared or anxious, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you those who are sick, 
the families and friends of dear ones who have passed away recently. We bring before you those who are caretakers, doctors, nurses, chaplains. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you those who are out of work, those who are looking for work. We bring before you those whose work is not glamorized or valorized by our society. We bring before you those who are struggling to know their path or struggling to get by. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you others across the world, those known and unknown, those who live in places marked by the absence of peace, those who live in places marked by an absence of clean water or clean air or an abundance of food. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, gracious God, in the quietness of this moment and in the love that draws us near to you even now, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you to our choir, lovely. Our third reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 43 through 47, which can be found on page 886 of your pew Bible. I've selected this text for today because I want us to spend some time together thinking about the nature of the church or what it means to be the church. But first, let us read together. The author writes, 
all came upon everyone or the people belonging to the early church because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In light of this reading, it can be rather tempting to believe that the church once in the past enjoyed an idyllic or pure state. And it can be rather tempting then to reject the church when it doesn't live up to this vision. This is also tempting in fact that if one surveys the 2000 year history of the Christian church, we often find in various periods, some Christian person or group of people who boldly call the church to return to its roots, meaning this that we've just read, to return to the way the church used to be, to go back to being a first century church, a simplified church, a church that resembles this early congregation. Admittedly, the writer of the book of Acts paints a very lovely picture of this early church. People are gathering daily, breaking bread, sharing their possessions, having generous hearts. There are no concerns yet about denominational politics. There's little concern about budgets, little concern about social problems, little concern about the small things over which congregations can sometimes bicker. Not us, but others. Likewise, there's no mention here of people being excluded because of aspects of their identity. There's no mention of buildings to maintain. There's no mention of committee work to be done. There's no mention of congregation splitting or of delicate egos or hurt feelings or clergy misbehavior or declining attendance trends. Goodness, in light of all of this, how tempting indeed it is to idealize this picture of the church and to see so many glaring flaws in the church in the present day. While I do enjoy a bit of romanticism, the grittier reality and truth, however, about the early followers of Christ is that this pristine, idealized version of the church lasted for, oh, not very long at all. <laughs> Just a few chapters later in Acts, we see disputes almost immediately emerging between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. The apostle Peter didn't want to dine with Gentiles, which upset the apostle Paul. Conferences had to be arranged to determine what Gentile Christians had to do or not to do to fully be part of the church. Converted Christians of Greek heritage complained that their widows weren't being, look, weren't being looked after fairly or equitably as compared to the widows of others. Most of Paul's letters, in fact, are addressing disagreements among congregations he's helping shepherd. People favored one pastor over another. Wealthier church members were treated differently than people with more humble means. Theological disputes abounded. It did not take long. I'm following this train of thought today because I've had the church on my mind a lot over these past few months or over these past two years of being with you here at St. Charles or for the past 21 years of me being in ministry. I think about the church in light of its potential and more soberly in light of its realities. I think about the church in light of the harm it has caused and also in light of the beauty that it has birthed in the world. When trying to tease out what we might think about the church in the 21st century, or more specifically when thinking of all that we might do together here at St. Charles, I find it strangely comforting to remember that there has never been a time in which the church has had it all together. There has never been a time in which the church didn't have big questions with which to wrestle. There has never been a time when some aspects of this larger entity called the church didn't have some negative or exclusionary tendencies. I doubt that I need to stand in front of you this morning and rehearse all the ways that the church or church folks throughout the world find ways to get things wrong or find ways to exclude people or fight over inessential matters or lose sight of the way of Jesus and get wrapped up 
and cultural or racial or sexist or national baggage. I will not dismiss or gloss over such things because to do so would be to gloss over or dismiss the things that bring very much real human pain and suffering. And still, I think there's a personal and an intellectual part of me that wants to push for a more nuanced telling of the wildly diverse story of the church. I look around this congregation and I know that many of us have experienced some form of the church's writ large, the church's bad behavior, and yet here we all are investing our lives and time into this local community of faith. We know and believe that not every church is the same. So in light of this knowledge, I want to hold in one hand an honest account of the less than idyllic or pristine nature of the church as a human organization, and yet also hold in the other hand something of the good aspects of the church, something of the redemptive parts of the church as it is experienced. I find myself wanting to tell the truth about the church's flaws and yet also to speak not only to the church's potential, but to the real actualized goodness beauty and truth that can and does materialize and bubble up in congregational life. To help us hold these things together, it's helpful to always keep in mind a bit of a language problem. I'm going to get a little academic here. I apologize. It is for us linguistically convenient and necessary to speak of the church, capital C, as if it is a singular phenomenon that can be experienced out in the world. To look around our city, our state, our country, and our world, and back through 2,000 years worth of the church's historical existence, it is convenient linguistic shorthand to sum up all of the diverse expressions of Christianity as they have existed and to call them the church or the Christian tradition. But in reality, the church is not and has never been a singular phenomenon. It is not a monolith, in other words. As I've started to point out already, even in the earliest of Christian congregations, there was great theological and cultural diversity. There was great disagreement amongst the earliest of Christian theologians. There was great debate about social and political engagement. Even within the Catholic Church, prior to the Protestant Reformation, there were major splits and splinter groups and divergent individuals and movements who found themselves at odds with, quote, the church. I say this to point out, when I hear someone expressing frustration with the church is this or the church is that, I always have to ask, which expression of the church are we talking about? the liberal Protestant church, the evangelical church, church life as it's experienced in the Southern United States, church life as it's experienced in the North or in Latin America or in Europe or in Africa or in other places around the globe. Are we talking about churches who spread toxic masculinity or churches who fight against sexism? Are we talking about pastors who were bigoted toward LGBTQ plus folks or are we talking about pastors who are LGBTQ plus and or are speaking out on behalf of these, our friends and family? Are we talking about congregations who treat the earth as if it's of little value to God or congregations who care very much about this beautiful earth and our environment? Are we talking about the Christian faith of those who kept slaves or defended segregation? Or are we talking about the Christian faith of the abolitionists or of the enslaved individuals or of those who led sit-ins and kneel-ins and who left behind a beautiful witness to the love of Christ. When I hear, in other words, deep concern about the state of the church today, I try to say, hey, let's get really clear and let's get really specific about the church or the type of Christianity with which we are upset. I say we because I normally share those same frustrations. 
But still, let's get clear and specific because I want to be fair to the pain that has been experienced. And I also want to be fair to those Christian folks of all backgrounds who have for decades and for centuries, long before we arrived on the scene, who have fought the good fight and have tried to do what they can to make the church and the world a more just, equitable, loving, and compassionate place. Again, my point this morning, and let me be explicit about it, my point is not to whitewash the sins of congregations or denominational leaders or misbehaving clergy or lay leaders gone wild. My point is to provide a bit of hopeful realism, a realistic honesty about the flaws of religious organizations in some forms and places, and also a realistic honesty about the fruits of the spirit and the justice and the beauty that real people in real congregations have also cultivated in response to the world. The church, capital C, can manifest in our world in troublesome ways, and indeed it has, and indeed it does. But let us also take firm hold of a hopefulness and a deep rooted joy that the church has been and still is in certain forms and in certain places like ours, a place where those who are hurting can come for healing a place where those who are lonely can come for friendship, a place where those who are searching can come to find meaning. Maybe not all the answers to life, but meaning and depth nonetheless. Certain churches can be places where the guilty and the ashamed can feel themselves being knitted back together, a place where they can be told that they are still and always will be of infinite value and worth. Churches like ours can certainly be places where people can organize and be inspired to engage in greater amounts of social justice. And more simply, churches like ours can be places where we can share with one another, where we can enjoy music and food and traditions that give our life meaning. Churches can be a place where we can maintain and retail and keep alive a memory of a past people who believe that there is an infinite source of the universe or God, and that that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, and that this idea of God will always point us toward justice and truth and gentleness and kindness and patience, and that that God will be the compassionate heart to whom we return when our lives are over. And even on those days when we don't know quite how literally to take these memories, these stories, these theological truths, we still find them beautiful and comforting and meaningful. And we still choose to participate in a church that tells these stories rather than to let these stories die away or be silenced or be co-opted by others who would take these precious memories and sacred texts otherwise and do harm with them rather than good. Friends, we all know that there is a lot of hard-headedness and ugliness still to be found in this diverse, wider church and in the world. Such has always been the case. Such will likely always be the case. But I stubbornly still believe that the more beautiful aspects of Christian thought and practice do break through into our world. And I believe that they break through into our world here within this congregation. If I did not believe that, I would not be here with this congregation. And I firmly believe that our church in our own way can continue arranging our life together such that we give each other a life with greater depth and richness and hope. This is one way that we can be together and faithfully be the church. And for that, I am deeply grateful. Amen and amen.
We have several announcements today, and we have a lot of time for them. We will first uh, have Kathy, if you would come and share. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I want to let y'all know that uh, this Tuesday morning, there is a prayer vigil to commute Louisiana's death row at 10 a.m. on October 10th at the governor's mansion which is quite an amazing thing. Um, it was going to be outside the governor's mansion, but now it is going, he has invited the vigil to happen inside the governor's mansion. So um, if anyone is interested in attending in person, please come see me after the surface. If you're on Zoom, um, uh, find me, y'all know how to find me. And if you don't, you, you know how to find me. <laughs> um, and uh, and if you're unable to attend in person, but would like to lend your prayers to in that moment to that moment, it is going to be happening um, from ten at ten o'clock. So an hour of prayer for those of our Louisiana family who are on death row, whose uh, sentences we are praying for our governor to commute before he leaves the office. Um, we would appreciate your energy in that moment. Thank you. I could be wrong, but I believe that Kathy humbly left out um, that she has been asked to lead some of the music. Um, so I will do that on your behalf. But yes, so if you would like to attend or plan to attend, you may also um, be able to participate in that as well. Uh, let's see here. We do have several things um, to get through. Um, first of all, thanks to Dr. James Oakes. Where is Dr. James? Here. He is over here at the piano. Yes, thank you for leading us today. Thank you to the choir. Thank you, Tom, as always. Um, uh, two weeks from today, October 22nd, we will have our third quarter uh, business meeting on October 22nd. So mark your calendars for that. It'll be after worship as we normally will do. Um, Wednesday night, dinner and opportunities for fun are back this week, the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th. We're doing a three-week run here of dinners. Um, you will see information in your printed bulletin and in the bulletin um, that is online on Saturdays. Um, lots of things happening there. Paul has got ideas for leading the um, hymn singing for those who are participating in that. Um, if you are doing the book study with me, I have homework for you to do. Um, if you are able uh, this week, try to read the introduction and pages, uh, I think 62 through 99, it's in your bulletin, it's online. Uh, if you can get through that, that would be great. Um, if not, you can still come. There's um, a free digital version of the book online as well that is in the Saturday uh, bulletin that goes out by email. So if you are looking for that, or if you haven't put your hands on a paper copy of the book yet, just know that that is there uh, online. And if you still can't find it, just give me a call or email me and I'll get that link over to you. Please also remember that next Saturday, well, let me be clear too, sorry. Wednesday night dinners start at 5.30, uh, 5.30. And so we'll have time by seven o'clock to break for choir. Um, Danny's craft that Danny is leading uh, is next Saturday, October the 14th at 1 p.m. And that will either be in the fellowship hall or the parlor. If you are planning to participate in that and you have not yet let Danny know, please let him know so that he can plan accordingly for that. Um, blessing of the pets will be, we have beautiful signage in the back. Um, Nancy, do we have you to thank for that? We have Kathy James, Heddleson James to thank for that. So thank you to Kathy. We have, the, you'll see them later uh, in the back in the Harris room. That is next Sunday, October 15th at 3.30 p.m. You'll have time to go home, bring your, your loved ones back. We'll have it out in the courtyard. And I believe there will be all sorts of things uh, to, um, to bless the pets with. Uh, and so that'll be next Sunday afternoon at 3.30. Let's see. Sylvester, yes, we're reminding uh, congregation about the voting is ongoing already, 
Um, Sylvester uh, had uh, literature available. It's still available in the Harris Room. If you are planning to vote, if you have not yet voted, um, please consider that. There are pledge cards out um, for our congregation for those who are planning and know that they are planning to vote. It's not too late to do that. Um, next Sunday, <laughs> yeah, we still, it's not even close to 12 o'clock yet. Um, next Sunday, <laughs> um hey yeah 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 next sunday usually i feel like i'm in that last like few seconds that you gotta like boom 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 get through everything as quickly as you can um next sunday we are very fortunate for the first time to welcome mary catherine into our pulpit she will be sharing a good word with us and we are excited about that we have heard from taylor we get a chance to hear from mary catherine this is wonderful uh, we also, next Sunday, will have, this is to our good fortune, we have an abundance of voices. Um, I've invited Leah Lucas. Leah Lucas is the new executive director of Together for Hope Louisiana in Lake Providence, the ministry and the nonprofit that I used to run up in Lake Providence. She is new. She has gotten established there in June or July. She's already doing wonderful things. And one thing that the su supporting congregations, we try to have um, space for the director to come and to share with congregations across Louisiana who support that ministry and mission. So she will be with us. We'll carve out um, some time during the service before the sermon for her to, to quickly introduce herself and to give a little bit of an update. I believe her mom will be coming with her over from Texas and they're going to have a New Orleans weekend and that'll be great. Um, and then they will celebrate or be here with us on Sunday morning to share. So you'll see Leah next week and be able to meet her as well. And lastly, friends, I have a special announcement, and it is one um, unlike any that I've ever shared before. So I suppose I should just say it. It is with tremendous, tremendous joy that Emily and I would like to share with you all that we are expecting a baby. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, Emily has made it through the first trimester. We are around 13 weeks into this adventure, so we felt it safe um, to share the good news. We've been sitting on it for a long time now, but we were very excited to be able to share it. Um, I have told my mother that she could share it with the world as well, so she is excited. Um, and we will be expecting uh, the little one around the middle of April of next year. Um, so please celebrate with us and keep us in your prayers. Friends, now receive this uh, parting benediction. My prayer for you is that wherever your road may lead, may God bring you deep gratitude. May God's face always shine upon you. And may all of God's love and nothing less go before you on your way. Amen.